Welcome, everybody. It's nice to see the crowd here. First thing, so they don't forget it, lemonade on the lawn is lemonade in the fellowship hall because of the heat. <laughs> um, Pete and his family made it safely home in the wee hours of the morning, like around 3 in the morning. So, But they had a wonderful trip and everything. Uh, Ann Ramsey was able to leave the hospital, and she is out at the Woodland in the Brantley unit in 113 the unit. I don't know how long she'll be there, but I plan to go to go by and see her. We need to keep Glide and Janice still in the prayers and everything. And Mike McCoy, I haven't heard this week of how he's doing with his rib, but we need to still pray for him. And Jenny Bobko's grandson. We also need to pray for Dickie Crawley and 
Uh, he's doing, hopefully he'll be doing well. Rich, we thank you so much for everything you've done for us. It has been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure having you. I welcome everyone in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, as Ed said, my name is Rich. It's Rich Henderson. I'm the missional commissioned pastor for the south side of Virginia in this presbytery. I would ask that you be with me now as we move from coming here to being here. Pray with me. Lord of our lives, descend in all your power and all your love upon our hearts this day. Give to us new vision and new hope as we worship you. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, he who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, both now and forevermore. Amen. Please join me now in our call to worship. Make a joyful noise to God. Come to God with song. We belong to God. Our hymn will be number 263, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. 263.
Please join me in our confession. If we had known it was you, Lord, we would have done something different. If we had known it was you, Lord, we would have given you food. If we had known it was you, Lord, we would have taken you in. If we had known it was you, Lord, we would not have passed you out. But alas, we did. Too often we make excuses for not taking care of each other. We have ignored your commandments to love and care. We do not deserve forgiveness, but we ask for it anyway. We ask you to help us change our ways so that we do best in silence. My friends, Christ rules over us all, seated at the right hand of God. This is the same Christ who came to be with us, to laugh with us, cry with us, break bread with us, and be one of us. Amen. Amen. Our God seeks the lost, brings back those who have strayed, binds up the injured, and strengthens the weak. As we have confessed both corporately and personally, we are forgiven and restored. My friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Please be seated. I know Sophie wants to come up. How about the other young lady? Would you like to come up? Since there's two of you, Sophie, since there's two of you, sit in the front pew, okay? And I'll come down there. Sweet little deer, not a deer, just a lamb. Just a lamb. <laughs> but what I want to do now is just kind of spend a little prayer with the two of you. Okay? Can we bow our heads? Lord God, these young ladies here this morning are so dear to us. 
so important to this church and to the ministry that I do and the ministry that each of this, this body here today does. Be with them as they grow. Keep them in your service. Keep them on a straight path and love them dearly. All this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a Bible with me. Thank you. Pray with me. Draw us close, Holy Spirit, as the scriptures are read and the word is proclaimed. Let the word of faith be on our lips and in our hearts, and let all other words slip away. May there be one voice we hear today, the voice of truth and grace. Amen. Our first reading comes to us from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34, verses 11 through 16 and then 20 through 24. It begins on page 984 of the Pew Bible. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep. I will seek them out, as shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep. So I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on the day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the watercourses and in all the inhabitable parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, I shall judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and goats. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted at the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide, I will save my flock and they shall no longer be ravaged and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. And I, the Lord, have spoken.
Hear now the gospel of our Lord according to Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, which begins on page 35 in the New Testament. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, you that are blessed by my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the gospel of our risen Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, the Matthew text that I just read has me asking, how many times have you heard the parable of the sheep and the goats? If you've been around the church for a while, you've no doubt heard it several times and are quite familiar with it. It's one of those passages that underlies what theologians call the social gospel. The parable says that all the nations were gathered before the judge, before the throne of the Son of Man, before the king, and the king separates them the right from the left, the sheep from the goats and he judges them. And those on the right are saved and those on the left are condemned. We know the basis upon which the king makes his final judgment about the nations when they're gathered before him. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was stranger and you took me in. Oh, how well we know the story. And for some, for those who measure things by how much they've done, it's a warning. And for others, others who also measure themselves by what they have done, for them, it probably seems to be a comfort. Yet despite our knowledge of this parable, our reassurance that we know what it means and we know the God from whom the story speaks, I suggest that we have not quite grasped the fullness of the parable. I ask you today to think with me about the response of the sheep and the goats who stand before the king and to consider with me the message that is found in the surprise that is expressed by both groups, sheep and goats. I find this parable to be full of shocking, unexpected, dumbfounding surprises. Surprise at the words, at the judgment of the king. Surprise that it is not at all our beliefs that are considered by the king, but our actions. Surprise that it is not our religious pedigree 
that is considered, but our compassion and our love. Some say that this is because the judgment of the nations is just that, a judgment on those people who are not joined to Christ, on those who, as scripture says, are judged by the law that is written in their hearts. Now others say that the judgment of the king applies to people's believers as well as unbelievers. That Jesus in telling this parable makes no distinction between those who follow him and those who do not. For all people are expected to live by the law that is written in their hearts. That as the apostle James puts it in the second chapter of his letter to the church, faith without works is dead. Now whatever the truth of the matter may be, there's a judgment and in that judgment there is indeed a great sense of surprise in both those who are sheep and those who are goats. Now, of course, one might expect the goats to be dumbfounded by the words of the king. They're supposed to be confused, shocked and surprised when at last they come face to face with God. Are they not? Their unbelief is meant to be confounded their lack of compassion and mercy for the least among us. Yet the amazing thing about this story to me is that the sheep are also surprised. The sheep, those who are righteous, those who have given the cup of cold water, who have visited those in prison and worked in the food pantry and taken in refugees and strangers, are just as dumbfounded and shocked by the king's judgment as the unrighteous. Both groups, you see, both sheep and goats, ask the very same question of the king when he renders his judgment. Both of them ask, when, Lord, did we see you? Lord, when was it we saw you hungry or thirsty or naked or in prison and took care of you or did not? There was a time in my life I thought this surprise on the part of the sheep was a good thing. I felt and believed that their surprise fit in very well with the biblical injunction to not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, especially when it's doing good. I felt that the surprise of the sheep was good because it indicated that they weren't simply doing nice things to those around them as a way of winning points from God. That it meant that their love and their compassion for others was unstained by selfish thoughts, unstained by the idea that they were somehow winning their salvation. Their words of surprise seemed sweet to me. Lord, when did, you, did we see you? When was it we saw you hungry or thirsty or naked or in prison and took care of you? And so, I let the more hidden message pass me by. But after reading and studying this passage again last week, I've come to the realization that the surprise of the sheep can be seen in a very different light. I don't really know how to characterize what that light is and what it reveals, but I do know that it makes me feel a little sad. Why is it that the sheep, the righteous ones, were surprised? Why is it that they did not see the Lord as they reached out in acts of love and compassion? What did they miss? What do we miss? I think of the great joy I have had when I've been the recipient of other people's kindness, other people's love. As a young man entering college, I belonged to a church, Bethlehem Lutheran in St. Charles, Illinois. I wasn't very well known to those who worshiped there. I'd been away at military school. I wasn't involved in anything but attending worship Sunday mornings during summer months. But very, 
During my very first Christmas home, my family and I were involved in providing the needy with boxes of food, clothing, and money. It was an incredible feeling to be so richly and unexpectedly blessed. I felt love in return, and I praised God for it, as well as the fellowship with those who had reached out with us. That act of kindness done by that congregation altered my life and eventually bring me to a, brought me to a better understanding of Matthew 25 today. Now as a person who has been in just a minor degree of need, during my 9-11 experience when I could not return to my apartment, which was four blocks south of the World Trade Center, others took me in. I learned right then what the acts of love and care performed by strangers can mean. Each of you, I hope, also knows what it can mean. Each of you, I trust, has a story like mine tucked away in your personal history or somewhere in your family's history of kindness shown to you by others. So now I ask you, what are we missing when as performers of these deeds of kindness, we are somehow still surprised when the Son of Man says, I was hungry and you gave me food, I was thirsty and you gave me drink, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. What are we missing when we feel tired from giving to one more worthy cause or worn down from working for one more worthy organization? What are we missing when we do good and yet feel that we have not yet seen God? To that, I think there's a simple answer. We're missing the sense of the holy in the ordinary. We're missing the sense of the eminence of God through the presence of Jesus Christ. Now, it might be stretching a point of the parable of the sheep and goats, but I can't escape the feeling that we all too often lead our lives as if Christ was not there also. Even when filled with doing good, we often are not sanctified or blessed or made fully alive by the sense of his living presence. My best moments as a human being are not just the moments when I show care to one of the least of my brothers and sisters. No, my friends. They are when I do so in the awareness that I am ministering also to the Lord. When I'm aware that Christ inhabits the least of my brothers and sisters. Whether these brothers and sisters are the less fortunate of those joined to Christ or even the pagans and Gentiles among us, those whom we do not consider to be our brothers and sisters because of who they are or what they have done. Such, of aware, such awareness keeps me humble. Such an awareness serves to keep me alert. It's an awareness that I think we should all cultivate. This awareness that Christ may be found and found especially among the poor, the lonely, and the sick, among those in prison, and those who simply need a drink of water. Think of it. Think of it some 2,000 years ago, when the Son of Man, the one who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, wandered as a poor preacher in a poor land, having no home to call his own, much less a throne of righteousness, Think of it for a moment when the Son of God was tried for blasphemy and flogged as a common criminal and then hung on a cross as one accursed. When, Lord, did we see you? When was it we saw you hungry or thirsty or naked or in prison and took care of you? And then think of today, 2,000 years later, where is Christ to be found? Is it not among us as it was so long ago? Is he not according to his own words 
to be found in the least of our brothers and sisters, in those who are neglected, scorned, or despised. For me, thinking about where Christ is to be found has transformed what I do and helps to transform who I am. It gives me a rich feeling and meaning to my actions. It lifts up my spirit in hope and in worship. It makes me want to praise God. Even when I'm feeling tired and worn down, it gives me new strength. What a privilege we have. Each one of us, when we reach out to touch someone, for in doing so, we may be, no. I say we are reaching out to touch God, reaching out to touch Christ. So I think I finally understand the surprise of those on the right hand of the Son of Man. I now understand the dumbfoundedness of the sheep. I understand it because it's so easy for me to forget the privilege I have. So easy for me to start living as if Christ was not actually here in this building, this town, this nation. So easy for me to do what I do as if it were a burden rather than a glorious service to our God. Yes, I understand, but I also find it a little sad. Sad not because doing good has no effect, but sad because seeing that Christ is in those around us can also be enriching, so helpful as we walk the walk that he calls us to walk. When, Lord, did we see you? When was it we saw you hungry or thirsty or naked or in prison and took care of you? And the king will answer, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. So come today and share in God's grace, the generous God who would not see even one of us perish. May it always be so, my friends, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now stand as we are able and state our beliefs using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to the as quickly as the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our hymn will be number 187, Savior, like a shepherd lead us. 187. Thank mm -hmm. you.
seated. Pray with me once more as I pray our pastoral prayer this morning. Lord, we think of all the places where we can find your son Jesus and hear him calling to us. We think of how he is present in the lives of those who are sick and how we can see him in the face of strangers who come to our land. We think of how he longs for us to visit him in prison and cries out to be fed and clothed and given shelter from his place in the deserts and jungles of our world. Help us to be more aware, Lord. Father, you have given us strength and ability. Help us use what you've given us as you wish to see us use it. Help us to minister to you and to one another. Sanctify, O oh God, all your people. Make us more holy, more loving, more caring, more joyful in your service. Father, we pray for those named in this place this day. We pray, too, for those in our prayers as we name them now in silence in our hearts. O oh Lord, hear our prayer that you would reach out through your spirit, using us or others or simply your invisible hand, to bring to pass that which they most need in their lives right now, be it healing, comfort, or strength. This we pray in Jesus' name, he who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the glory, the King, and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, we are the receivers of love, receivers of grace, receivers of Jesus. But we're to be givers as well. So following God's call, may we now bring forth our tithes and our offerings. Please, as you have time, place them in the plates at the back and here at the front of the sanctuary. Thank you, God, for hearing us when we call upon you. Thank you for coming to us in Christ Jesus and for granting to us those things we most need from your hands. Accept, we pray, these tithes and offerings, our gifts, gifts of gratitude, and bless them and us that they and we may serve to bring your saving word to others as well as the glory to your name. Amen. Our closing hymn will be number 353. My hope is built on nothing less. 353. <laughs>
charge all of us to give thanks to God for the life we have received. Now make us one in love and service to our community and the world, for there our Savior lives. Go in peace, love and care for one another in Christ's name, and may our Lord and King watch over you. May our shepherd and our shield defend you, and may our rock and our fortress, our judge and our hope, keep you safe and strong within his life-giving word, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>